Hey friends, visit patreon.com slash femfreak to join our podcast community. Okay, you want to talk about America in 1932? Then let's talk about America in 1932. We're not putting um, like blackness in, on center stage or queerness on center stage. These people actually existed. In fact, the version that you think you know that is all white, that is all straight, that is all Christian, whatever, you know, that is the false version. That has always been the inauthentic. Welcome to Feminist Frequency Radio. This is the show that asks you to be critical of the media you love. I'm Anita Sarkeesian, and I'm joined today by a mysterious dame with the kind of smile that'll make you kick a hole in a stained glass window. Carolyn Pettit. Hey, hey. <laughs> and <laughs> and a hard-boiled Seamus who keeps one hand on the Roscoe and the other hand on the bottle of rye whiskey, Ebony Adams. Yes, that is me. Um, I can't do the, like, the fast-talking, the, like, mid-Atlantic accent thing that <laughs> I feel okay. like this needed. <laughs> uh, can you do it, Carolyn? Uh, I know. Uh, maybe. Okay, I was just waiting. I was like, I bet you Carolyn can do I this. <laughs> probably could, but I, I need to warm up a little bit. I'm not, yeah, yeah, uh, sure, not sure. in the right headspace to give that a <laughs> shot right now. If you haven't guessed already, this week we're going to be talking about the HBO remake of Perry Mason starring a FFR favorite, Matthew Reese, which totally confused me because there's a different character named Matthew, but his character's not named Matthew. And I kept being like, why are they talking about him to him? It was very weird. Anyways, <laughs> content warning. Some of the subjects matter we're going to be discussing um, as related to the show includes mentions of disturbing violence and probably some racism, because I'm definitely bringing that up. Um, And we'll also be talking about the season finale, so spoiler alert. We've never done content warnings for racism. I just feel like I'm going to address the fact that there is so many racial slurs in this. Mm -hmm. Anyways, that's it. Stay tuned, everybody. (laughs) (laughs) I just felt weird about being like, I'm going to talk about racism. Everybody be warned. I I appreciate the content (laughs) warning for racism. It's one of those things where like you just swim through the miasma every day, you know, if you're a person of color. So you like, there's a way in which you always kind of expect like, uh, there may be some bullshit, you know, um, in this thing. So it's nice to be, to have someone be like, hey, just so you know, there's going to be some bullshit. (laughs) So you can decide, I don't want to hear that today. Yeah. I agree. I'm glad that I'm glad we did that then. Mm-hmm. Um, so question, do you want me to save my fun stories about how I injured myself multiple times this weekend for the bonus or should I share them now to get us like in the mood for violence? Can you give us like a teaser and then save the rest for the bonus? Because I feel like this is longer than a banter story, you know, like it's really not. Into it. Oh, but- okay. Uh, it's really not. But now, teaser, it's all going to be in the bonus. I injured myself <laughs> <laughs> like an idiot. And stay tuned for the bonus to find out how. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, just multiple thank whatever times. As you pray to that Anita doesn't have your phone number, because if she did, she would text you a picture. <laughs> Uh, Ebony was not pleased at the photograph <laughs> that I sent her of my Whatever, of Joyce one Carol of my I was like, I'm tired of seeing fucked up feet. Why am I seeing <laughs> fucked up feet everywhere? At least I didn't send you a picture of my butt because that's where the other injury is. We would not be having this conversation. I would be gone. Like, <laughs> that would be the end of our <laughs> professional relationship. <laughs> but we'd still have a personal one. I hear you. I understand. Mm. <laughs> let's talk about it later. <laughs> All right, let's get into this. In June of this year, HBO debuted a gritty prequel of sorts to Perry Mason based on the popular Earl Stanley... Earl? Early. Mm -hmm. Early. Early. I think it's Earl. Earl. Yeah. You're an Earl. It's spelled E-R-L-E in case anyone is wondering why I paused there. Earl Stanley Gardner uh, novels and TV series from the 50s and 60s about an upright criminal defense attorney with an uncanny knack for winning even the most hopeless of cases. This new take on Perry Mason's origin story is set largely in Los Angeles in 1932 against a backdrop of a nation still broken by the Great Depression, ruptured by racism, and struggling with the after effects of World War I. 
our hero is cynical, desolute, world-weary private detective of the noir school investigating the kidnap and murder of a very young child. Along the way, he's surrounded by the kind of unforgettable characters that deliver incredible one-liners and powerful performances. Of particular note is the character of Paul Drake, a holdover from the books and TV series, but here reimagined as a black LAPD detective navigating a racist department and a corrupt system. There is so much to talk about here, from the look and feel of the 1930s America to the way the show powerfully indicts the American exceptionalism, capitalism, white supremacy, misogyny, and toxic masculinity. Oh, it does so much, doesn't it? Mm-hmm. Okay, so I won. I did not want to. I didn't want to talk about or watch this show because I didn't want to do another like legal drama, you know, like this, when we started, when the show aired, it was when we were having all these cop- conversations about copaganda and like not mm-hmm. centering these stories that are like, oh, the legal system is great. Um, and then, but I knew I was probably going to watch it anyways, because it looks like the aesthetic of this, right, is going to be a mm-hmm. big thing that I think we talk about. Um, but I just found it so fucking boring until it wasn't, <laughs> right? Mm-hmm. Like it, this... I I bounced I almost bounced off of this and I think I kept watching it because I was like, well, I got nothing else to watch right now. Why not? And then all of a sudden it like transformed for me kind of in the middle of it. Um so I uh, yeah, and, and that's a totally, you know, I I hear you on that. So I I wound up watching the series twice uh actually because oh. uh, so and this is uh, this is a thing that happens to me sometimes with with a lot of s- stuff that has like complicated criminal plots. So for instance, there's the film LA Confidential, which is mm-hmm. one of my favorite films of the 90s. I think it's a, an amazing movie. But like the first time I watched it, I was my brain was so busy just trying to piece together or follow like the 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 like conspiracy, like the labyrinthine plot that it tries to, you know, piece together that like I couldn't really get into the characters and the, you know, the 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 emotions of of the story. So then I watched it a second time and I was like and I was like, oh my God, this is amazing. Because that second time <laughs> I wasn't paying attention to like I already had a good sense of the the plot structure. So I could focus more on like character motivations and atmosphere and all that other stuff. And 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 that really worked on me the, the second time. I had a kind of similar experience with this where I feel like like for uh, you know just for me personally part of the reason i wasn't really feeling it so much on my first viewing was because there's so much going on plot wise in this uh series as it as it you know you kind of start to get a sense of just this all the moving pieces in this the the you know that the wound up causing the death of this um this you know baby boy um and then the second time i i i was able to to experience it in a different way because the the groundwork had already been laid in my brain for like that larger aspect but there's one thing um that i find i mean there's a lot that i find super interesting about this series but you know for me like one thing that i really find interesting is the way that i think it is in conversation with the figure of perry mason as some people already know and understand him. And particularly that that's going to be from the CBS show, because yes, mm-hmm. you know, he did originate in, in novels, but most like the popular uh, image of Perry Mason for any, for those who have an image in their minds is going to be from the Raymond Burr CBS series. And the, that the, the HBO series kind of makes that explicit at the end of the eighth, the season finale, because the music we hear over the end credits is the CBS Perry Mason theme. So it's like a little way of saying the origin story is complete and Matthew Reese is now the <laughs> the trial mm-hmm. attorney. But but the one thing what I love about this show is the way that it, as I say it's in conversation with that earlier show and the way that it's I feel like it's simultaneously an homage to that show but also like a rebuttal of it. And mm-hmm. we can get into this in terms of the show how it deals with race and gender and sexuality which is like really exciting to me how it's a lens is so different from that of the CBS show but there's other stuff too particularly in the season finale there's this you know exciting opening sequence where Mason finally has Joannis on the stand the like the actual trigger man who has committed most mm-hmm. of the killings that you know that this uh, case has, has uh 
pertain to. And, you know, like Perry Mason's going to break him. He's got sweat on his brow. Like this is it. He's going in for the kill. And people who know Perry Mason from the CBS show, we know that is what he does. Perry right. Mason wins justice for his client by breaking the killer on the stand. That is what he does. That is his whole thing. And what happens? <laughs> what happens? <laughs> Hamilton Berger stands up in the middle of the fucking courtroom um, and says, it won't work, Mason. Nobody ever confesses on the stand. And for me, it was like this boom moment of like, yeah. You know that thing from the CBS show that is like the defining thing that he does? Yeah, that's not that's not going to fucking happen here. No, no way. <laughs> mm -hmm. I was like, I mean, I I was like, yes. Thank you for not giving me what I want, and thank you for yeah. not giving me what I expected from this. I thought that was like exciting as hell. That it was so explicit. It's clearly kind of talking to the audience and like us, our expectations, like just just laying out that it's not going to do that thing that we expected it to do. Not to like super jump on the end, but since we're already here, mm -hmm. I was like, the tone of the show cannot allow her to be innocent by a court of law. Mm -hmm. Like, it just can't. But they're also, you're just like, no, she can't be found guilty. That's not going to happen, right? Like, they walked that line really smoothly here in terms mm -hmm. of how, how like, you know, the the the, the jury came back um, yeah. as, a mis as a mistrial. Yeah, to me, the one core difference, like, ideologically, you know, to, if to put it simply, between this series and the CBS series, is I would say that the CBS series, even though, in the CPS series, yes, Perry Mason is always defending innocent clients who are, you know, being uh, dragged into the justice system against charges you know, that are fa ultimately false. I feel like the CBS series and the character probably historically, you know, is used in, in stories that use him to suggest that the system works and the HBO series uses him to suggest that the system doesn't. Mm -hmm. mm. Yeah, I, I think that, you know, as you say, Carol, like this is this show is in conversation with like the kind of the iconic version of Perry Mason that, you know, even if people haven't seen the show, they probably have heard of, you know, kind of exists in, you know, our our um, cultural imagination and in the way that like that that previous version, unsurprisingly for its time, existed in a very black and white world when it came to like determining like who was innocent, who is not innocent, who is guilty, who's good, who's bad. This show from from the fact that there are I can't think of, you know, really a single character who is you know, like unambiguously sort of like good, mm -hmm. you know, um, kind of uncomplicated. Um, but also, you know, to the to the way that the show is filmed, like there's there's this like it, it's exquisite in it, in its way. Um, the kind of like washed out colors and the way that things will look very indeterminate on the screen. You know, like it's there's very little um, like sort of stark you know, oh, I can see from the way that this person is framed that, like, they're the hero of the shot, you know? Um, or, like, this is, you know, like, uh, there's always something to kind of complicate it. I found this show so interesting to watch. I watched it in two chunks. Um, so, like, the first three episodes and then the last five, um, roughly, back to back. And I have to say, it worked for me, and I don't know that I would have stuck with the show if I were watching it week on week, this is, you know, you know, we can have the conversation about how, you know, our kind of binge watching culture has affected the ways that, you know, narratives are shaped. But it really worked for me in this instance, because like you, Anita, you know, I wasn't sure after the first couple of episodes whether I was going to keep going. But by the time that I was hooked, the the way that I had been drawn into the world that had been built there, like it was the momentum was too great for me to stop. You know, yeah. but from the very beginning, like the thing and the thing that kept me going from the end, it was not the plot, you know, which normally that kind of like, you know, murder plot, you know, is my jam. But it was this show is like just a rogues gallery of the most amazing character actors. There is not a single person who I would have recast. The in acting this was amazing. Like It was absolutely amazing, yeah. you know? And yeah, I think that. Th that point about morality too, Ebony, is is like mm -hmm. how none of these characters, um, you know, maybe Della, but like yeah. most of these characters are not like unambiguously good. But it's but it's so refreshing to me. You know, we ha we 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 live in an era, and we have for a long time 
with everything from Breaking Bad, you know, to now Barry, which is another HBO show uh, that, you know, it centers like a very, very, very unambiguously bad, evil white man who I think the audience, Mm -hmm. you know, still like, like Walter White, the audience kind of sympathizes with him and sees him as like redeemable, even though he's a completely Mm -hmm. unredeemable, you know, uh, murderous, you know, piece of shit, like who has just done so many horrendous things. Like what I, part of what I love about this series is that it doesn't, is that it, it allows characters like Perry Mason to be really complicated, flawed, et cetera, and yet still fundamentally decent. Like, like he's mm-hmm. still out. He has that core morality where he is like heroic in a way. Like, I mean that 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 credo that that's kind of like in a way the philosophy of the show almost, or could be argued that way of like um, of you know the way I see it. There's what's legal and there's what's right. Has this kind of like almost goofy hopefulness to it, or it could have in the hands of like. Um, a show that was less tonally um, grim, you know, or, 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 or softer, but um, I don't know. Like, I just, I just really, I, I like that these characters are complicated, but, and, mm-hmm. and certainly not by any means like morally like uh, pure, but are nonetheless like, you know, you believe that, that at their core, there is a, a, a decency there. Yeah, and they are so fascinating. Like, they're so well-drawn and three-dimensional that there were many times where I was like, you know, I could watch a show just about Della Street or just about Lupe or just about Strick or Paul Drake. Like, there's there's almost no character that didn't feel, like, fully realized, you know? Um, they They were not simply background characters to, like, Perry Mason's grand drama in the way that often... These shows about these, you know, like broken white men, everyone else in their universe exists purely to interact with them um, and to like process, you know, help them process their emotional development. That's not at all the case here. I mean, I don't totally agree with that. Other than someone like Sister Alice, they all revolved around Perry Mason in terms of how the story, like, I feel like they were very flushed out characters and like, I'm not arguing that, but I still think like the show is about him and about everyone's interactions with him and how they enter, how they interact as a part of this. Well, I mean, for for the purposes of the show, yes. But I'm saying that like, you know, like Paul Drake, for instance, we come to see what his life is like outside of inner interaction he has with Perry Mason, you know? Yes, so, true. you know, his, yep. his, his, his life with his wife, his, you know, you know, career as a police detective, you know, like there are things that have like no bearing on the case. And I think the same is true for like Della, although we don't spend nearly enough time with Della, you know, as far as I'm concerned, nevertheless, like I'm, I'm, I'm fascinated by the glimpses we get of her with, you know, her girlfriend, her life at the um, at the boarding house. Like, you want to learn more about this, you know, this privileged woman who gave up, you know, her family and her position. Um, you know, I just feel like they're, they, they feel real to me. In episode five is the episode that's mostly about Paul Drake's life. And mm-hmm. it, it is pretty, you know, like, you, you see his family, you see his backstory. And I made a note to say asking, is racism a side story or intertwined into the main story? Because it did, at that moment, because I wasn't that far into caring about the show that much, it was like, okay, well, we have a Black character and we're going to talk about, like, Black issues now and then we'll get back to the main show. Um, And I think that the way that they did all of that was because at the end you realize that he's going to become... Mason's investigator, right? That he's going to, like, in the in the next season or whatever, like, he, you know, he's obviously this person that's of note um, that that's coming in. But I did, it did have that little bit to it that I was wondering, like, is this going to be substantial or is this just, like, trying to be not all white? And and part of why I, I started questioning it early on, um, and, you know, this is sort of a question for everyone, is that, like, the show is acknowledges how deeply racist um, the world is in this moment in time and all of the, like, many, many uh, racial slurs that are used to describe all kinds of different people. Um, Mm. And I was, like, I was being, I was really turned off by that. Like, I know that there's a a quote-unquote realism or historical realism that is coming into play, but it was just, like, 
it was a lot for me to to hear all of these like racial, like super racist. I'm not, I mean, I'm not going to say them. You can watch the show and, and hear it. But, um, you know, there was the first episode had um, an incredibly large man that was being ridiculed. They were talking about like a dead guy wearing um, man clothes on the outside. You oh know, like there's just all of these things that like. So, I, didn't like mean, I didn't mean that please. to sound the way it did. Sorry. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, so so in addition to what I was talking about before, all of these were just like, is this really necessary? Like, did you really need to use these particular point, like these particular visuals and uh, ways of talking to make the point yeah. that you're trying to make? Uh, mm-hmm. And and I mean, so I will say, so my feeling, and obviously, you know, it's just my feeling is, I I feel like this could have been the sort of thing where it could have felt really tokenizing. Like, oh, they made Paul Drake a black man and they made Della Drake like a queer woman just to seem, you know, people could have leveraged the criticism. Oh, they do that to make it seem quote unquote woke, but it's just this like surface thing. But I really felt like all of that ends up being kind of core to what I feel is this show's larger systemic perspective about these things. And so for me, even things like like where the the coroner makes that throwaway comment about the body and says, oh, he was wearing man clothes. He was wearing, you know, a bra and panties underneath his man clothes. Like, mm-hmm. I feel like there's a theme running through this series about the lives that, and the things about ourselves that we, or that people have, that, that marginalize people or that, 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 you know, that shouldn't marginalize people. And, you know, I mean, like, like there's that, that little detail with Della where when, um, when, um, the, uh, the baby's mother, um, uh, what's her name? Um, Emily, Emily Dodson. Yes. When Emily Dodson is staying at Della, Della's like the house, the boarding house where Della lives. Right. Like Della has to make up this excuse like, oh, someone, you know, the woman who runs the boarding house said it's OK. I'm going to go bunk with, you know, this mm-hmm. when it's like her girlfriend, like like the ruse, the, the 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 performances we have to put on and all the bullshit we have to do to exist in a society that like hates us for who we are. You know, I mean, I, I, I don't know. I, I, I appreciated like all the Mm. little things that kind of contributed to that. And, and I think that, um, ultimately for me, part of what the eight episode, like slow buildup, let this series do was establish what I felt was this kind of larger systemic perspective that pulls in gender and sexuality and race and all of these things. My God, I love the character of Lupe so much. Like, Mm -hmm. um, and uh, just an amazing performance, first of all. Um, But also like um, the way that, you know, you know, you might think she's this mercenary businesswoman, the way that she buys the property that uh, Perry's... Well, hold on, hold on, just for folks. Um, okay. Lupe is Perry Mason's lover. Yes. Like, they have a romantic relationship. They, they basically fuck, like, and that's it. Yeah. They're not together, but so... Right. And they work and, um, on the same, like, plot of land. Right, and she runs... She right, owns but importantly, airstrip. she's a pilot, right, and she owns the airstrip and he wants to buy his land, yeah. so there's always that tension. And, and when, um, and when Perry them. finds... Like, just sp- speaking of their sexual relationship, when Perry finds out that she bought his property, which she had kept telling him, like, I'm I'm gonna do this, I'm gonna do this, he says, mm-hmm. like, well, I didn't know you were fucking me just so you could fuck me. Um, but then, like, the way that she, in episode eight tells him like lays out for him why she mm-hmm. did what she did it is for like that for me was like oh i i loved it i mean i just love the complexity of these characters i love how multifaceted they are and i love the i've been watching some episodes of the old cbs perry mason lately too you know like i cannot go back and watch that show without realizing how limited and how white and how wealthy its Mm -hmm. lens is on Los Angeles and on its characters. And then you have here, like, this, you know, brown woman pilot speakeasy owner, you know, amazing character who, you know, who does, who's fighting tooth and nail for her livelihood in, um, in this city, in this world that hates her, you know, for being a woman and for being brown. It's like... Mm -hmm. I, mean, I don't know. It, it's thrilling it, to me. I I think there's something I I agree. I that ending. I like I wrote 
I agree. That whole, what Lupe like calls him out on his shit yeah. at the end about why she's doing what she's doing was very powerful. Um, and the fact that like they, I think that the show, so my problem was all of the uses of, um, which I think Carolyn, the uses of slurs, which Carolyn, I think you explained really nicely about like kind of why they can be justified, I guess, in the context of the show. Although I still find them uncomfortable. Absolutely. Um, yeah. Which I guess is the point. Um, but I, th- I think that there's something really interesting about shows that are like, okay, we need to grapple with our history. Um, you know, putting aside the arguments of like, let's write new stories and let's let, yeah. uh, you know, other folks write stories and all of that. Putting that aside, um, it, it, I think that the interweaving of different identities, um, so especially of marginalized folks, into these historic stories that were traditionally all white and very like, mainstream is really interesting. And it reminded me a little bit of like Godless on Netflix. Did either of you watch that? No, no, but I um, mean, you've, it, t- you've talked about it to me before. I did. I think I mentioned it in a freak out because yeah. it did something similar with like, you know, you're talking about like quote unquote cowboys and Indians, right? Like it's a wild West story. And they actually like were very creative in how they integrated uh, like w- women into this world. Like they did it by, <laughs> they did it by, by having all of the men in one town die in a mining accident. So it's a, a town full of women. And then they had like, you know, they just dealt with race and gender in creative ways to be like, okay, this is a Western, but we're going to, you know, interrogate it and, and, and investigate like, okay, who was around and what can they actually do? And so I think that like you were saying, this show does that in ways that feel more sincere. Um, I, I kind of want to talk about the church. Mm-hmm. So um, Sister Alice is played amazingly by Tatiana Maslany, who you might know from Orphan Black, who played 2,000, 1,000 million characters as a clone. Mm-hmm. And like the church's interweaving into this story, I thought was another level of like um, complication, mm-hmm. <laughs> right? Like sure. who goes against the church? Like the church is not evil, Um you know, this show is very much like every institution is corrupt. And so they brought in, uh, they brought this in, in, into the discussion as well and inter, interwove different levels of corruption into this sad story. Yeah, th- there's, um, I mean, the, the, everything that happens with the church is super interesting on a, on a, lev- on a gender level level too, because it's this thing that was created obviously by sister Alice and her, and her mother, um, and played by the great Lily Taylor. Um, but, but, you know, but has just been completely taken over by money and by men. So, you, you know, there's this one scene where Lily Taylor is like dwarfed in the room by like the, I don't know, 10 or 12 white male elders who have like, you know, who are doing what they want to do with, the church. But so, yeah, part of, you know, as you say, Anita, like kind of with the connection to Godless, part of why I respond as strongly as I do to this show is because historically, like I love, you know, hard. I love the aesthetics. I love the the atmosphere, the seaminess the, of of like hard boiled crime fiction. Right. I just I just find it like intoxicating. Um, but but it usually does or, it you know, come with all this baggage of like it's just not, it, you know, that's not like great <laughs> to put it mildly in terms of race and gender and all these other things. And I'm not saying this show of Perry Mason is faultless or flawless by any stretch in those areas, but it is this sort of this thing of this like little, for me, bit of joy of like, oh, I can have like actual hard boiled period crime fiction, you know, my angel's flight and my like, is you know, speakeasies mm-hmm. and my like my just see me underbelly of Los Angeles shit that I love so much and have it not be like total garbage in terms of like what it's saying about police or what it's saying about, you know, systems or gender or my, you know all these kinds of things like there is that 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 joy to, um to it for me certainly yeah i love the um the occasional like nods to actual history here so um the character of sister alice is absolutely you know a reference to sister amy um who's incredibly incredibly popular and successful church um, here in Los Angeles in the early part of the, the 20th century really was like, you know, part and parcel of like the beginnings of the evangelical movement in this country. And so this notion of like America, you know, coming out 
um, of a Great Depression, coming out of World War I and trying to, you know, grasp after something that will give, you know, often very poor people hope. One of the things that was just like made my gut churn while watching this is watching the um, the folks in the church office open up envelope after envelope of money, of, of these donations they've received from their parishioners or people who across the country listen to Sister Alice's radio show, knowing that like the 50 cents they send in or the dollar they send in represents just an incredible financial outlay for them. But the 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 kind of like balm that Sister Alice um, gives in the show and that Sister Amy offered in real life was absolutely so vital for them, for this country that was just struggling so hard just to, you know, kind of find itself. And then also the character you mentioned earlier, um, Anita, I think in the show he's called Chubby Carmichael, but, you know, reference to Fatty Arbuckle. Like, I, I just... I, I oh. love this, this show's like refusal okay. to say, you know, like, oh, this is this is a complete fiction, right? Um, what they're offering here is they're like, okay, you want to talk about America in 1932? Then let's talk about America in 1932. You know, um, yeah. and you know, we're not, we're not putting um, like blackness in on center stage or queerness on center stage. We're not, you know, t- giving you this Latina character as some kind of like, you know, token. Um, as some kind of sop or whatever. Like, these people actually existed. In fact, the version that you think you know that is all white, that is all straight, that is all Christian, whatever, you know, that is the false version. That has always been the inauthentic um, version. But we're going to give you a much truer, you know, kind of representation of what was there. Um, and going back to, like, Paul Drake, from the from the moment he's introduced, I was so nervous for him Uh Knowing, I mean, like, listen, I don't want anybody to be a cop, but I was like, okay, black man, <laughs> you've decided to be a cop in like 1932. Like, I just don't see this working out for you. And, you know, like there's the ways that he's talked to by other white police officers, the way that we know from the very beginning that this incredibly, incredibly like smart and sharp man is never going to make detective. He will always be a beat cop. He will always essentially be like, you know check in, you know, meters to make sure they're not expired. He's never going to be able to, you know, to be elevated through the ranks in the way that he deserves. In the way that he and his family are constantly vulnerable in a way that surpasses even the vulnerability of other people in the text who are also vulnerable. Like, the show is so specific about the ways in which, and, and the um, the actor who plays Paul Drake, Chris Chalk, is the way he kind of very rigidly holds Paul, like his posture is is so rigid and like controlled and like self-protective um, because he is literally like constantly having to look for the next attack or the next thing that will trip him up as a black man that could quite literally take his life and potentially the wife of his, you know, his his wife and his unborn child. You know, like it's just a like virtuoso performance um, from him that, you know, as we go on, you just you fear for him. There are times when he has to just like swallow the shit that he's being given and you feel his, his, his realization that like, if I don't do this, something bad will happen. So I can, you know, stand up and I can, you know, keep my integrity or whatever. Um, and, and, and possibly be killed for it, or I can accept like the bribe, or, you know, I can, you know, alter the story of what I actually found at the crime scene. And even though I know it's alive, maybe I get to survive and keep my job for a little bit longer. Like you feel him having to make those decisions and reckon with those decisions. Yeah. I was, I was like, I was so afraid for him. Like, you know, Mm -hmm. that he, he is taking way bigger risks than Perry Mason is in this series, Mm -hmm. right? Like his life is way more, um, in danger. And I just love, you know, uh, there was a little moment where he's, his investigation takes him to a motel and yeah. it, he's, he's trying to find out about Noah, Novak and Sarecki, I think if they were there, or mm-hmm. I don't know, I forget what stre- thread of the, of the thing he's investigating, but the manager, the white woman manager totally brushes him off. And it's this, you know, like Spanish speaking, brown like housekeeper who like runs up to him and is like, I, you know, I remember those men, I, you know, I, I love those little moments of like solidarity, uh, like yeah. uh, among the kind of the marginalized and the, you know, the um, people. 
And um, and I also another favorite moment with uh, Paul Drake is when he's in the the, the black nightclub, um, and he gets the file. Um, mm-hmm. And I forget exactly what the dialogue exchange is, but the woman who is helping him, you know, who get, hands him the file, you know, says something about him being like black and blue, right? Uh, you, mm-hmm. you know, black and blue, and he he says like, oh, I think it's time I made up my mind or yeah something like that yeah. right like like he's realizing that that the t- those two things at least in in any way that he can live with and that feel mm-hmm. morally you know cohesive uh, um uh, uh, to him are are in, are incompatible um, yeah. yeah the the last uh two episodes i think really um cl- like brought together and climaxed a bunch of the gender stuff um, that I thought was really interesting. And 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 I, I say climaxed in that, like, it's explicitly stated um, where you see, first of all, you see Della has a quote-unquote fiancé where they're each other's beards. <laughs> like, they're both mm-hmm. queer people and they're like, cool, we found each other. We're going to, like, hide out for each other kind of thing. Yeah, real quick, that character of Hamilton Berger is is basically Perry Mason's adversary throughout the entire like CBS series. So I'm real, real excited to see what happens oh. with him in, in the, in the future uh, seasons of this show. Nice. And Strick goes to work for him. I was like, oh man, like I'm excited for Paul Drake to take over his investigator. Yeah. But I didn't want Strick to leave. Strick was my favorite. Yeah. So in the last episode, you have um, Della trying to convince Perry that Emily's ready for the stand, and he she gets torn down by Perry. Well, so she's like, Emily has been demeaned by all of these men, and like, let her tell her own story. Like, let her be be you know like on stand telling her story and stop being treated like shit by all of these men who are controlling her lives and Perry just rips into her being like this is your personal crusade he kind of attacks her for being queer like all of this shit um it's also um when you see uh Lupe talk about like race like being a woman of color and needing to stay ahead of the rest um and it's also um uh there's one other thing where is my notes Whatever, I missed it. But I bring that up because, one, there's all these great moments. Oh, oh, it's also when Della says, um, like, I'm going to make a great lawyer, no modifier, right? Like, no, Mm -hmm. not a lady lawyer, but I'm going to make a great fucking lawyer, right? Yeah. Um, But I I bring this up, one, because, like, those were great moments that I thought were wonderful. But also, like, I— I'm not totally with you, Caro, on the, like, Perry Mason is more complicated than an anti-hero. Like, he's a shitty man. Like, he is a, he he is complicated, and they've definitely made that complex, and they usually do that with anti-heroes when they're done well, but he is a miserable, self-centered, egotistical, <laughs> like, victim. He's, like, he thinks of himself as a victim constantly. He literally says... To defend his brutish, like, mean behavior, I ain't been myself, which is, like, exactly what abusers say after they abuse people. Um, And so, like, I I struggled with, like, Perry falling apart at the end and becoming just a fucking asshole to everyone around him and, like, lashing out at everyone, but then is sort of, like— becomes justified in his, because he's like, he's the only one that's fighting for the life of this woman. And like, it's all on his shoulders. And I just like, I, I got swept up in that narrative and I got swept up in the way that the show was presenting it. But I also took a step back and was like, you're a miserable piece of shit. Like oh, he totally is. And I mean, like, I love the, I mean, I feel like the show is <laughs> giving us a Perry Mason um, that is, that is not, whole unto himself like he is effective insofar as he has these other people around him um that either like mitigate his worst instincts and behaviors or completely you know like um take over you know and and you know are competent in ways that he is not perry mason would not have been successful to the extent that he is successful by the end of the show if it were not for the work of paul drick if it were not for the work of strick if we have zella wasn't there like he is not some like crusading guy who you know he's the only one who sees the truth whatever like he he he's practically like feckless on his own. The scene where he, you know, like gets off the train after EB's uh, funeral and he, he leaves the hotel early and he goes to see his son. And he's, his, his ex like, oh my God, I laughed so hard at this because I was just like, Perry, you are a real piece of shit. 
<laughs> so he comes to he comes to his ex wife's house like unannounced, right, and still drunk, and it's like you know I want to see my son, and you know his ex wife I can't remember her name lets me see him, but I'm just like, yeah, this is precisely why you're not married anymore, Perry. Like this is why you can't be up. Like you you never you, you never you know send you know Christmas or birthday presents on time. I haven't heard from you in forever. You only call when you're like maudlin and drunk and whatever it needs something from us. And then you show up drunk out of nowhere. Like he's just a piece of shit. Just a piece of shit, you know? And I feel like the show doesn't let him off the hook for that. For me anyway. <laughs> so I was expecting Carolyn to chime in with no, something. I mean, I mean that's, you know, uh, that's totally fair. I, you know, I mean, obviously, um, I, 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 I find, I find the arc that he goes on. I'm not going to, I'm not going to say that he is, uh, not a piece of shit, but I think that <laughs> I, I mean, I, I, I like him. I mean, I, I like him as a character. I, I think it's interesting that the, the that the way that he starts off being so lost I, um, at the beginning of the series. And I think part of why he's lost is that he doesn't have a way to put his ethics into action, right? I mean, we, we, we see that in the war, um, he, he killed, you know, I mean, he ended the lives and ended the suffering of his fellow soldiers who were for whom death was a certainty. It was inevitable. And for that, he was like dishonorably discharged, but it was something that he felt in the moment, like that he, he had to do. And, and, you know, that kind of in a way goes back to the idea of like the difference between what's legal and what's right in the eyes of the institution of the military, like what he did was, was like reprehensible and shameful. Right. But in his eyes, it was, what morale, what his morals and ethics demanded in that moment, even even as difficult as it was to do. And you see, he certainly did not relish doing it. It was not like it was horrifying and it was horrible. And I, I think that, you know, um, I, I guess, you know, uh, because I'm someone who who struggles to find work that that is in line with my own like moral convictions. Right. It's hard uh, to to find. And that's not fun. Um, and so, you know, I, I think that I like that ultimately you have this trio of him and Della and Paul, who are three people who have come together. And you're right, Perry would be lost without them. He absolutely needs needs them and their help. But that they they have created a thing together um, that mm -hmm. will allow the three of them in in a world that is just completely immoral and where the systems systems operate in unjust ways and, and, you know, on and on, they have created a little thing that will enable them to do work that is consistent with their, um, beliefs and their, their morals, you know, that, um, you know, as complex and kind of shitty a character as he is like that arc in and of itself is, is really, uh, uh, is cool to me. Yeah. There are two things that made me feel feelings at the in the last episode, like deep feelings. One mm -hmm. was the closing remarks about justice, not revenge. I was like, yes, mm -hmm. do it. Say it, man. <laughs> Convince them. And then the thing that I was not expecting that um, I thought was was I actually liked was when he goes to find Sister Alice and because he wants to know, like, what she believed was really going to happen, which is just this weird closure thing that, like, it's not like he was going to get any. And she um, she says, yeah, you're tired of being alone, but won't we always be alone? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then it's just like, oh, that just, like, ripped me a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> she looked so much like Lily Taylor when she went back to the dark hair. I was like, oh, yo, I can see this now. Although my brain was breaking throughout this show. Like, I... Lily Taylor, what? Her playing someone who could be the mother of like a 30 year old woman. I was not <laughs> mentally or emotionally ready. You oh, know? that and character was so ready. good. The manipulative mm -hmm. mom. Oh, God. The show was, oh, God. Everyone was so good on it. Jesus. But so good. And like, we haven't even talked about like Stephen Root, John Lithgow, amazing. No. Right. Like, literally, yeah. like the performances in this show are yeah. A. Well, 
Tune in for the bonus where we may or may not talk more about the show. I have a question about a court scene that I'm going to ask in the bonus <laughs> that I just remembered that confused me. Uh, I want to talk in the bonus about the actual um, cinematography of the show. Oh, yeah, Carol, we I know that. you will have thoughts about this because yeah. I saw a tweet of yours about the look of the show. Oh, yeah. Um, so yeah. if you haven't Absolutely. signed up for the bonus, sign up for the bonus this week because we're going to be getting into it. Yeah. All right, y'all. We'll be right back with our freakouts. Hey, folks. Thanks for listening to FFR. If you enjoy spending a little time with us each week, please consider helping us continue to do the show by heading over to patreon.com slash femfreak. Your support will enable us to stay on top of all the latest pop culture trends week in and week out, and you can get nifty perks like early access, bonus episodes, and friendly online communities where you can hang out with your fellow listeners. Go to patreon.com slash femfreak today. Operators are standing by. Now it is time to talk about what's been thrilling us, moving us, upsetting us, or infuriating us this past week. Who wants to go first? I'll go first. Um, so this may go off the rails a little bit, um, but uh, <laughs> I'm because I am terrified and I am angry. Um, uh, I'm going to talk about politics a little bit. Um, now, these opinions are mine and mine alone. They don't represent the opinions of, uh, the, the, you know, the oh, feminist Carol. frequency organization or what have you. But so let me start. Let me start by talking a little bit about. Let me just touch on what's happening with the post office. Obviously, there's a, a million reasons to be alarmed b- by what's happening with the post office. But one of the reasons that kind of that whole situation um, alarms me is that you know I see tweets from people who are saying things like, um, well, hey, this is just a perfect opportunity for like Jeff Bezos, you know, to to, to sweep in and create some privatized like post office or whatever. You know, people talking about these things as if that's actually like a good solution. And um, I guess the reason that uh, one of the many, many reasons I find that objectionable and terrifying is that like, um, you know, uh, we're facing a, a a uh, tremendous crisis right now. So many people are unemployed. They have no idea what they're going to do f- with for their futures. I'm kind of in that boat right now. My future is a big, terrifying question mark. I don't know what it looks like. I don't know what I'm going to do. And like, you know, the post office sort of represents the kind of place where, you know, since if I'm not able to get a job doing uh, the sorts of things that I've done in the past, games, journalism, writing, etc., which I may or may not be able to do because that market it has changed wildly and so on. You know, the post office is like a perfect example of the kind of place where I could have seen myself, you know, plugging away doing a, a, a job that I don't hate and that pays decently well and that would let me retire and so on and so forth. Um, those jobs are just evaporating left and right, leaving nothing but like the gig economy, you know, and I don't want to, I don't want to like kill myself being some gig economy worker for, you know, as I'm in my 50s and 60s and everything, which I turn 40, 44 next month. So I'm, you know, this is like a very pressing concern. So meanwhile, the Democrats, like this is like a, I feel like a perfect opportunity. Now I am just to, 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 to head off any chance of us getting angry letters that I'm like basically supporting Trump or whatever. I am voting Democrat. Be, you know, I think defeating Trump is a moral imperative. Okay. That said, like the Democratic convention, this is like a perfect opportunity for Democrats to to recognize the fear and the anger and like the the crisis facing so many poor Americans and so many working class people. And who is who is getting prime time? You know, who is getting time at the Democratic convention like John Kasich, like all these Republican, you know, millionaires, Meg, you know, Whitman. Oh, it's, God. It's yeah. on and on and on, you know, like. They they are just all the Democrats are sending it, the message that like we we are plutocrats we derive our own power from wealth we would sooner let Trump win again and maintain capitalism than move even a little bit to the left you know there, I go on YouTube sometimes I watch videos and Chuck Schumer shows up in, in ads and he says things like um, we you know we're approaching a, a fundraising deadline uh people like Nate Silver from 538 tell us that such and such and I'm like stop I want to punch my monitor and say stop with this wonky you know uh uh bullshit and like show some human emotion and like align yourselves with 
with us people who are in terror, in crisis, who, you know, we got $1,200 like five months ago. And, you know, now we're like, we have no fucking idea how we're going to pay rent. You know, show some human emotion. Align yourselves with us. Take our side. Be with workers. Be with be with poor people, and they won't do it. They can only send the message again and again that they are aligned with wealth and power and that they will basically, you know, they don't care about us at all. It's all you, you know, just show a little human emotion, care about us, and they can't fucking do it. And I, I'm, you know, I'm like at my wit's end as I'm worried about my own life and worried about where this country is going, and I feel like things are going to get so much worse before they get better, and I'm just so aghast at how the democratic leadership is handling uh this moment where they they could it's i feel like things were handed to them on a silver platter where they could you know seize this moment and really make it clear you know make it make themselves stand for something and they just are dropping the ball and it it makes me so it heart heartbroken and angry and and scared i um completely agree and I feel like if I actually respond to that, we'll be here for like three more hours yeah. oh, listen, talking I'm, about this. I'm going to cede my freak out time. I can't go yeah. after that. Like, no, that was yeah. too powerful. That's, uh, that's real, you know? Like, I'm, and I didn't mean Carol, to, I'm, I didn't I'm, mean I'm, to, I'm right there with you. Like, uh, it's one of those things where you almost can't, you can't uh, articulate it, you know, because the fury and the fear is too overwhelming. And then you think the people who are ostensibly, you know, allied with us, like the the person they're yeah. giving us is Meg Whitman, fucking chairman of Quibi. I don't give a shit what Quibi has to right. what? Right. Like, I don't, I don't have health insurance. What are you talking about, people? Exactly. Like, 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 you know, like these are the, you know, <laughs> I can't, re like, how are they going to speak to my experiences? How are these... You know, these people, these like Republicans and these like, you know, multi-millionaires or billionaires going to speak to my experiences right now. They it's just they're so completely out of touch with it's with what we are actually facing right now. It's really I think it's really challenging to wrap your head around all of this because, or my head around all this because I 100 percent understand why and how the Democrats are the way they are. Oh, yes. Well, right. Like not, not saying you don't like I, I, we can logic this. We can understand yes. why they're doing this, but it is so ba utterly baffling. Like mm -hmm. when you're talking about being frustrated, I'm like, we need more words than that because it's so like in a global pandemic, the democratic candidate is someone who said that he would veto Medicare for all. Like if anybody has illusions about how the American political system works, like it doesn't work for the people. Like it's not representative. This is not a representative democracy by any stretch of the imagination. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We're talking Joe quote, nothing would fundamentally change, end quote, Biden is our candidate at a time in history that could not be making it more clear just how much things need to fundamentally change on, on yeah. it's how also many levels. like the strategy of this, like if you want people, so the Dem the Republicans are doing everything they can to um to to stop marginalized people, especially Black and Brown communities, from voting. Like, and they're doing it right. Like, there is legitimate concern about access to voting, um, and the Democrats' response to that is to put in a candidate that nobody likes, that nobody cares about, that nobody is excited about, that nobody is going to come out. Like, but, no one is yes. coming out in droves. Right, right. Like, nobody who, who, you know what I mean? Like, yeah. if you had someone who actually had really progressive values, regardless of whether they could institute them or not, that's a whole other conversation that we're not getting into. But, like, yeah. people came out for Obama because he said some shit that got them excited. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. It like, and I'm not getting into the conversation yeah. about what Obama did and what right. he hasn't done and all of that shit. But like the people were legitimately excited about real substantive change in some ways. And granted, again, not that that really happened, but like, I just don't I don't get I don't get how they're so fucking stupid right now. Well, it is transparent yeah. that they that, you know, they kind of closed ranks around Biden to protect 
wealth and, you know, the health insurance industry and institutional power, right? Like, it's that- got to go. And you know what? This shit's not going to go. This shit's not going to change from the top. Just everyone needs to know that. Like, the presidency is not in a, a platform that is going to be for the people. It's just not. It's not yeah. built that way. When you look at the wealth of the people who are our representatives, it's like they're all rich. <laughs> They're all fucking rich people, right? Like, how are they supposed to represent the interests of middle-class, working-class, poor folks? Mm -hmm. There we go. We did it. Fuck. All right. We're going to end here. (laughs) Hey, if you've got a freak out, you should share it with us (laughs) at feministfrequency.com slash freak out. F-R-E-Q-O-U-T. If you're freaking out about this election, we want to hear from you. I guess. (laughs) Thanks so much for listening to Feminist Frequency Radio. Uh, Stay tuned for the freaking after party, which is only available to backers of this podcast, which you can learn more at patreon.com slash femfreak. Um, This show is engineered by Rob Perra. Carrie Simpson provides technical support, artwork by Jamie Varon, and our intro music is by Phil Circus. Join us for another week, next week, of another episode. (laughs) (laughs) Whatever, y'all. Join us next week. Bye. See you then. Bye. Bye, y'all.